Good Tuesday afternoon to you. Four o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. NFL meetings continue to go on. The owners meetings out in Orlando, Florida. Uh, from those meetings, we hear uh, G Jimmy and D Haslam saying um, that they are close to extending the contracts of both head coach Kevin Stefanski and general manager um, Andrew Berry. Let's welcome in Fred Greetham from the Orange and Brown Report. Uh, he's the senior analyst there. And, and Fred, not a surprise. I guess the question would be, in your mind, how long do you think those contracts extend out for? So this year, plus how many more would you imagine? Yeah, I think usually they're somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five years. I think the first one, that's what it was. You know, Stefanski just finished his fourth year. I think Barry was also on the same one, or they're going into the fifth year. So I think that's what they both started with. I mean, yeah, it's no surprise. It's really, you know, when do you announce it now that the owners have pretty much, you know, said it's going to get done. We felt that all the way. Um, I mean, Kevin Stefanski, I think he's, you know, if he has a season like last year, I think he'll be up there ranked about third <laughs> all time in coaching wins for the Browns. I mean, Paul Brown, Blanton Collier, you know, have numbers, but I think he could even pass Marty Schottenheimer this year, um, you know, Sam Ritigliano. So, I mean, what, what do you want out of a guy out of first four years? Uh, two NFL Coach of the Year awards. So, yeah, there's he's a work in progress, but I think it, just like players, you've seen him get better, you know, each year. The only thing I ever hear about is play calling, and you might not even have that to kick around, you know, anymore. So <laughs> as far as Andrew Barry, I was just, while we were waiting here, I was just looking at the roster, the depth chart. I mean, how can you argue with what Andrew Barry's done? Um, I, right at, Right off the top, there's 10, 12, 15 players that pop out to me that are probably the best that have been on this franchise since the return in 99. I mean, you have, you know, just look at the number of pro bowlers and top players at their position. I don't know if the – I know it's a low bar since 99, but even all time, you know, you have a running back right up there, you know – in the same breath as a Jim Brown or, or Leroy Kelly when he was healthy and wide receiver with Mari Cooper now is right there with some of the best miles Garrett, you know, on and on. So no, I, I don't think it's a surprise. I just think it's when you're going to do it. Yeah. And, and to your point, uh, franchise droughts that were broken since Stefanski and, and Andrew Berry have taken over. Uh, first playoff win in 26 years, that was in 2020. First winning season, 13 years, 2020. Uh, one first season opener in 18 years, 2022. First defensive player of the year in the history of the franchise, that was last year uh, with Miles Garrett. Um, and the other thing, Fred, the more you hear free agents and guys that have even been here a year that have come from the outside, they've kind of done what they were trying to do in changing the culture. And that's not an easy thing to do. And it appears, you know, I guess you're only as good as your last one, one loss record, but it appears that this culture has, has been changed. Yeah, I mean, you money does speak. You know, it used to be you had to really overpay to get – free agents to come here in the early years of 1999. And even, you know, it was kind of a joke in the media room. Guys just came here to cash out. You know, that was their last contract. And they were getting end of the career guys for big money um, just to try to be relevant. Now, just, just the fact that they were able to re-sign some of their key free agents, you know, is a testament that guys want to play here. You know, Zadarius Smith had been moving around in recent years. And, uh, you know, Maurice Hurst, you know, wanted to come back. I think Shelby Harris, who had kind of been a mercenary going team to team. Rodney McLeod just re-signed. The punter re-signed. You know, and so, you know, those are good signs. And, and you've been able to bring in, you know, outside players as well. And, you know, even 
I'll even allude to Mike Vrabel coming here. You know, he's a pretty accomplished NFL coach in his own right, and he's willing to come in here, plug in, learn from the Browns system, see what they're doing. So likely he can take it to the next stop he has, you know, in the NFL head coaching carousel. All right, um, this coming from Andrew Berry. Uh, Mary Kay Cabot uh, tweets this out. Um, Andrew Berry expects Nick Chubb to start doing some uh, light running this month as opposed to conditioning work. It's the next step. Next three months will determine when um, he is available, um, if he's available at the start of the season, if he's available a couple weeks into the season, um, all to, to be determined in the uh, next three months. It, but that is a really good sign. He, obviously, as a running back, you can't do anything until you can start running and cutting. Yeah, well, it's so hard, you know. Most experts will say a guy's better the a year out from his surgery, obviously. You know, and I almost think anything you get in 2024 is going to be a plus. Um, it's good that, that all the markers are being hit. But I would really like them to, and I think they will, err on the side of caution. Because when do you need Nick Chubb? Do you need Nick Chubb? closer to being Nick Chubb in the second half of the season when you're going on a stretch drive and trying to make the playoffs and you want him to be as close as he can be back to himself at the end of the season as opposed to at the beginning of the season. Sure, if you're out of the playoff hunt because in the first half of the season, well, then it didn't do you much good to save him. But... I just think all things being equal, if you can bring him along, and I think that's the signing of Deontay Foreman points to that. You have a veteran. I kind of wrote about this before free agency. You don't. I didn't expect him to go get a big name guy, but Foreman was one of the names I mentioned. You know, on a short term, prove it deal. They're not married to him. You know, and they can also draft a running back. You know, maybe on the third day, like they had with Jerome Ford, and you have a maybe a trio of Deontay Foreman, Jerome Ford, Pierre Strong, or a draft pick until Chubb's ready to go. That way, you don't have to. You don't want to force him, you know, before he's ready to go. And and I think they they will do that. I would expect him, you know, maybe to be ready for training camp. But I would think they'd he'd start out on the pup list and bring him along slow. I mean, why, why put any pressure on him to be ready for September, you know, at this stage of the game, what, what does that really do for you? So I, I know you've, um, you're in the process of writing a series of articles, six steps to putting the Browns back in the playoffs, 2024 mid free agency. Uh, step one was trade for a wide receiver. Take us through that article and do you think they've done enough? Uh, have, they, have they gotten to, to where they need to be to get back to the playoffs? Well, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, I wrote that just before free agency kicked off, and I had a countdown, <laughs> and number one was trade for a wide receiver. I didn't say sign one. I didn't say draft one. I said trade for one, and they did in Jerry Judy. In fact, <laughs> I had it all done. But it was to go out on Monday morning, and I think they made the trade Saturday afternoon. So I went ahead and posted it and just said, you know, this is what I had. I had Judy as the third option. Obviously, you don't know who's available in a trade, but they made they made the option to go more for the upside potential in Jerry Judy. I think that I think it's a great move to get ahead of the market and, and have enough faith in him to sign him to an extension when you see what guys are getting paid in free agency. And next year, there's even a bigger class of free agents like Jamar Chase and and uh, that ilk of player, Justin Jefferson, guys like that. So the free agents this year weren't even that big of names and they got big money. So if Judy can, can do anything, they will be in good shape. The numbers were escalated when they first came out. If you look at what we've reported, Jack Duffin's kind of a capologist, that they the agents always, you know, count in every possible 
you know, uh, incentive, which they should, but it, but it, it isn't as bad or big a guaranteed overall as it was first reported. I think it's about 28 million, but that being said, I like him. I think, I don't think he's as good as Amari Cooper right now, but I think it will help paired with Amari Cooper, who he has said he was his hero. One of the reasons he went to Alabama and I think he's going to follow him and, and learn some things from him. But I think he would be ahead of Elijah Moore. But from that aspect, I think he's similar to Elijah Moore. He's got a little untapped potential. So the Browns believe enough in him. They've tried to get him for a couple years. So you got to trust in Andrew Barry. I would like to see him add another veteran. I, I know they like Cedric Tillman and David Bell. But I would rather have, you know, even at this stage, bring in a one-year veteran, you know, late in his 20s or early 30s that could step in and at least be the four receiver, you know, at the top of the depth chart and maybe even draft one if one falls to him. I know the room's crowded, but I think you want as many weapons as possible. Right now, I look at the the really proven receivers on weapons on the Browns receiving being Amari Cooper and David Njoku. Jerry Judy, I haven't seen him play in this system. Obviously, they feel he's proven. Elijah Moore was coming on, but I didn't really see him break out. So I would like to have a guy that could step in like, you know, I was calling for Mike Williams before he was released to trade for him and, and do your thing. Or a guy like that, he, obviously he got released and he – got set, signed to the Jets after the Browns made the trade. So I'm not saying it has to be that type of player, but there are about a lot of veteran wide receivers that are going to be available that have played and, and been productive, and maybe they could step in after the draft, see how the draft goes, and then go from there. Fred Greetham, Senior Analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Now I can step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break. Um, are the Browns a big threat to the Chiefs in the AFC? One national analyst for the NFL Network thinks so. Hear him on the way back. Sports for CLE, be right back. Stay with us. All right, everybody. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. It's like the $1 Lady Luck 5X. Because the pink really pops like my safety vest. Plus the $1,000 grand prize really ham is at home for me. And this $2 10X really nailed it for me. Two bucks for a shot at 10 grand? That's rock solid. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever with five price points from $1 to 20. They're built for fun. Former defensive back Jason McCourty um, on the NFL Network's Good Morning Football. What he thinks of the Browns this season coming up. For the second straight year, we're talking about what their potential is. But we saw something about the Cleveland Browns last year that I think was special. This is a team that, Shrakes, you emphasize it all season long. We started talking about Coach of the Year with Stefanski because this is a team where their offensive line was beat up. It felt like guy after guy was going down with an injury and somebody else was going to have to step up. We watched the star of their team and Nick Chubb go down with a gruesome injury in Pittsburgh early on in the season. We watched Deshaun Watson get banged up and have to play through different injuries. Watch a rookie in DTR come in and have to win games. P.J. Walker had to win games. And then eventually they signed Joe Flacco off of the couch. And this was a Cleveland Browns team that was playing on the road in Houston for a playoff game. Yes, they didn't win, but you learn something about your team when you have to go through that level of adversary. adversity. Now this offseason, they go and they make a trade for Jerry Judy to be opposite Amari Cooper, a guy that he grew up watching and trying to emulate his game after. Now they have Elijah Moore in the slot. Nick Chubb hopefully can get back to where he was. But then Jerome Ford as a backup showed what he can do. So I look at this team in Cleveland and Jim Schwartz comes in as a defensive coordinator last year. Miles Garrett becomes defensive player of the year. They have so many guys on that side of the ball to go and get a veteran like Jordan Hicks at that linebacker spot. To me, the Cleveland Browns could surprise a few people mm -hmm. and potentially say, hey, we have a seat at the table and maybe we can do some things and we can get healthy and get on the right track. Fred Greetham, uh, Senior Analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Fred, um, I think people are overlooking, you know, the Browns are getting back 
both tackles, actually their top three tackles healthy, uh, potentially Nick Chubb at some point, Deshaun Watson. Um, it was a team that won 11 games and did it really beat up. Going into last season, we talked about it here and about any show I was on, um, the Browns are under the radar. And a lot of it last year, I think, because of Deshaun Watson, the national perception, and even going in this season because of the injuries and, and what's happened to him, he's a, he's a big unknown. But they, they are under the radar, and it starts with AFC North. I mean, when you look in the division, we've said this. It's a gauntlet. you got to play a third, more than a third of your schedule against three perennial playoff teams in the Ravens, the Steelers, and the Bengals. And they've all improved their team. Steelers got two legitimate quarterbacks now. And they all have defenses, and the Bengals are healthy. And you look at that first. Well, then, but you look at the Browns. They had the number one ranked defense, I mean, on paper. They didn't look like that in the playoffs. Their statistics kind of started to fall off at the end. I'm more interested in them lowering the points given up a game on defense, but a key fact is they kept nine of the 11 starters, and the two starters on defense, Sion Taki Taki and Anthony Walker, I think they wanted to try to upgrade at linebacker, and I feel they did with Jordan Hicks. I don't know about Devin Bush. I think he's more of a depth guy, hoping to catch lightning in a bottle. He hasn't done much since his big injury, but right now, um, Hicks is a leader type that Walker, but he's won over 100 tackles the last five years, and I think it's an upgrade there. I think Quentin Jefferson's an under-the-radar move. He is an upgrade over Jordan Elliott. So they, they need a little more at linebacker. I would expect them to bring in a veteran linebacker to compete to start. But again, a lot of times Jim Schwartz uses two linebackers, and you got JOK and Jordan Hicks with Bush's depth and Tony Fields and Diabete. So I see him filling holes in the draft and free agency there. But I think the defense comes back intact. They got the most important players back in Zadarius Smith and Shelby Harris. And you just saw Rodney McLeod come back. So I like what they've done. Offense, you know, we can say this all day it's it's going to come down to number four he has to be on the field and he has to play well I keep defending that if he would have stayed on the field he would have put up good numbers last year but when you start you stop you start you stop you know with injuries you know that's that's kind of what you're going to get so if Deshaun Watson can play the whole season I think this all comes together and they'll be in good shape. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and again, I, I don't think people realize, especially in football, you got 11 guys who have to be on the same page. And if you're not out there, the more consistency, you'll get more consistency the more snaps you can get in a row with Deshaun Watson. I, I firmly believe that, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this from the 33rdteam.com. Players who could be traded uh, before the 2024 draft, and one of them, the NFL, they say, is Greg Newsom. If the Browns are going to extend another defensive back, Emerson would be the priority over Newsom though that would have to wait until 2024. As it stands, Cleveland has to make a call on Newsom's fifth-year option by May. If the Browns want to move on from Newsom, they can have a fifth-round pick Cameron Mitchell on the roster. Um, that would be as the slot corner. I don't think there's any way that they don't pick up the fifth-year option on Greg Newsom. Um, my question would be, do you think they trade Greg Newsom? Yeah, it really could be a, a guy you trade over the draft those three days. Um, it really depends on what you think of the guys you have. We know they think of Martin Emerson highly. It really comes down to what do you think of Cameron Mitchell. Um, we all know a year ago there was rumblings that Newsom asked to be traded. He didn't like being penciled in as a slot corner. 
We all know the reason there is because the slot corner makes about half of what an outside corner makes. And I believe they smoothed that over by having them all kind of play. Even though he played in the slot, I think the idea is, you know, you're playing and we look at all our cornerbacks the same. Now, whether that has ironed itself out or not, do the Browns feel that he is worth paying, you know, 15, 18, 20 million a year like they did Denzel Ward and they're going to have with Emerson coming up. I think exactly they will pick up the fifth year option if he's still on the team the first of May. But they could move him over the draft for a pick if they feel like there's somebody they want to add or make a trade to add at a position that they feel they need more depth, whether it be linebacker, whether it be edge rusher, whether it be on offense, wide receiver, whatever. At this point, all things being equal, I believe it'd be very similar to Jedrick Wills or any of the other guys. They would pick up the fifth-year option, and then they have this year and next year to figure it out to find his replacement, and they might want to see another year of Cameron Mitchell. Or if they do trade him, I could see him then drafting somebody or signing one of these free agents on a one-year deal to plug the hole because I don't think they want to go into the season short at cornerback. You had a strength, and don't get me wrong, Greg Newsom as your third cornerback is pretty good, but I don't know when it comes to getting paid if they feel that he commands that type of money when you might be able to get somebody for a lot less that – that can fill that role. Fred Greetham, senior analyst from the Orange and Brown Report. Now I'm going to step aside, take one more time out. Other side of the break, we'll head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. We'll also hear from Dante Foreman, newest Browns running back, Sports for CLA. Be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Try C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hey, Dave. Frank from Cleveland. Follow up voicemail. I got love for Deshaun, but all the pieces are in place on defense and offense. He's got more than enough weapons. There's studs all the way across the offensive line. He's got to produce this year. I mean, I hope he stays healthy the whole year and all that. But, you know, I got serious love for the Allens, love them too, for sinking all the money into this team and the city. But love you, brother, and I'll talk to you later. As always, uh, appreciate all the voicemails. Fred, um, yeah, I, I, we had talked about it earlier in the show. It starts with Deshaun staying on the field, and the Browns have done – they've surrounded him with um, – they're doing everything they can, I think, to maximize Watson. He, he's got to go out and he's got to perform. He's got to stay on the field. Yeah, I've said that and probably continue to say it. I mean, the last we saw him, he was 14 of 14. Led him on, on a comeback over the Ravens, who arguably were the best team in the AFC, you know, up until they got beat by the Chiefs at the end. Um, and he had a broken bone in his shoulder, and he had a high ankle sprain. Um, you know, every time it seemed like he started to get things going in that Titans game, then found out he had a sprain rotator cuff and was off and on got going again with the Cardinals game then he got going with the Ravens and then the injury so I just think if he stays on the field he's proven he can win games and he's a good player I don't think any team that would have five quarterbacks starting games you look at the caliber of backups in the NFL for the most part most of them have a tough time you know winning you know being 500 so the pieces are there, as the caller said. The defense is there, and they've added 
you know, just the healthy guys coming back, the offensive linemen and a Nick Chubb and adding Jerry Judy. I mean, all that should bode well. So Deshaun Watson really has no excuses. They really need him to step up and, and have the type of season that they expected him when they made the trade. This is going into the third year. So there's really no excuses, you know, but I guess you really can't fault somebody for getting injured. He really hadn't been an injury-prone person in his career. Um, But last year, he tried to play through it, and obviously, you can try all you want, but if you can't perform, you can't perform. Yeah, and that's the one thing. He he didn't, you know, he tore his ACL, but he, he I'm with you. He has not been injury prone, um, but he couldn't stay on the field last year. We talked a little bit about Nick Chubb earlier in the year, and, and you know, you made the point, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. You don't want to rush him back. You want him back playing when he's as close to Nick Chubb as possible. Explains why the Browns signed Dante Foreman, one-year contract, a little over $1.1 million. Uh, Foreman, this is why he chose the Browns. So we were just going through the process, you know, um, and it was stressful at times, too, because I just you know, I was kind of ready to get it over with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had a couple options, man. So once I, once I weighed my options, I just felt like, man, this would be a great fit for me. Um, you know, just seeing the team uh, – that that's here and the defense like I, I had a chance yeah. to play against that defense last year man so that was crazy I I was able to feel you know how those guys um was playing and yeah. you know how, how they're flying around to the football so uh so I was very intrigued about that and then also just seeing the weapons and everything that you know that we have on the offense side of the ball as well too man it's it's just it's exciting you know just every 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 piece that's here to the puzzle man it's exciting so I'm, I'm looking forward to it for sure yeah and uh, Fred remember the Browns got a First-hand look at the type of player Foreman is. Uh, he was running against him against the Bears. He alluded to that. Um, it's a guy I like. I liked the signing. He he gives you something that you didn't have in your other running backs, uh, other than Nick Chubb when he's healthy. <laughs> yeah, well, he's going to assume the Kareem Hunt role. Kareem Hunt, you know, former NFL rushing champion, kind of evolved last year into the short yardage back, and he was good at it. I mean, he had – they put him on third and one or third and goal or fourth and goal. He had nine touchdowns. He had the two touchdowns in the playoffs. But he was clearly, you know, not, you know, the, the elusive runner in the open field that he had been prior. And I think Foreman, you know, is that what they were looking for. I had him as one of my options. That was one of my steps to get back is I didn't feel like you wanted to rush Chubb. And you didn't want to go into the season with just Jerome Ford and a, kind of an unproven Pierre Strong. So I expected him to draft a running back or add a veteran and a foreman, you know, in a little over a million dollars. They're not married to him, doesn't have that much guaranteed. So it allows Chubb to come back on his timetable, but gives him a veteran that has done a good job, you know, in, in his time. And he'll be motivated in the time in there. And so I think all the way around, it, it's the type of move that I was expecting the Browns to make. And I think they're going to still run the ball. And and you want somebody that can get you that first down. So I think, yeah, I think that it's – it's uh, if you would have went out at the beginning and there were some bigger names in free agency, and, and if the Browns would have went hard at one of the big names – you know, you you would start to doubt what what's their commitment to Nick Chubb. I heard they were they were interested in Zach Moss, but they backed out when when they were only offering like one year. So to me, that was kind of good news. Looking that maybe they felt better about the possibility of Nick Chubb returning. I'm sure Foreman's somebody they talked to in the early going, and then like he said, he looked around at his options and getting a one year prove it deal with the Browns is what he felt was the best. And I think, you know, it's a high upside with low risk. Yeah, and you're, uh, the, the comparison to Kareem Hunt, uh, a really good one. I, I, I see that, and um, it makes a lot of sense uh, for them to add that um, in conjunction with Nick Chubb. Uh, Fred Greetham, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Fred. Thanks for having me, Dave. 
Fred Greetham, make sure you check him out. He is the senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Casey Kinneman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Straight ahead, stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K through 12. Is your K through 12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the school of the year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns on Sports for War CLE. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hey, guys. Dan in Maryland again. I know with Winston we can all cherry pick whatever stats we want, you know, support whatever argument we're trying to make. But the numbers that I keyed on were his 10 starts with New Orleans during his four years with the Saints. And in those 10 starts, you know, he had a 6-4 and four record, over 2,000 yards passing, 61% completion percentage, 18 touchdowns, 8 interceptions. Added another 180 yards on the ground as well as a touchdown. If he's able to perform to that level, we need him to play for several games in a row. We'd all be thrilled. Anybody would be thrilled with those kinds of numbers from their backup quarterback. And with regard to Tyron Huntley, I think a lot of people are really overthinking this one. I've no doubt that my fellow Harvard alum, Andrew Barry, all he did here was, was just being a typical opportunistic self. Saw a quality backup quarterback available for probably somewhere around the league minimum who, for whatever reason, wasn't drawing much interest from other teams. And he decided to jump on him and grab him. What this means for the 53-man roster come late August, we got plenty of time to worry about that. Anyhow, keep up the good work. Go Browns. As always, appreciate all of the voicemails. Let's welcome in Casey Kinneman, Dog Pound Daily, as well as the Barking Browns podcast. And Casey, Jameis Winston's, we've said it before, he might be the best backup quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, he's. if you look around the league at backup quarterbacks, I would be hard-pressed to find someone with better skills and abilities as a backup quarterback than Jameis Winston. Last year, when we were going through our quarterback Armageddon during the season, he was a guy I was interested in trading for, you know. And so to get him to come in, be a sounding board, have that experience, he's a guy that you don't have to get ready for the game. He will be ready. So if something were to happen, he could step in at a moment's notice, and your skill level doesn't drop off as much as it does with most of these quarterbacks around the league. Yeah, and again, he does throw in. He has thrown interceptions when he was a starter. So again, I get that. I, I, don't, don't email me that. I know that. <laughs> I know Jameis Winston. Um, the one thing is, and, and we've talked about it, Kevin Stefanski seems to get a lot out of guys like Jameis Winston. So I'm curious if they have to go to him. We'll see. Take a look at this. This might explain the whole Tyler Huntley and, and what um, the Browns were thinking. So Jonathan Jones, uh, NFL reporter, national reporter, NFL will now allow teams to promote a practice squad QB to the active roster for game days as an emergency third quarterback an unlimited number of times during a season. So you do the math. If you can have potentially three active quarterbacks, you want to have four quarterbacks that are available to you. So I, I, I have a sense that Andrew Berry and, and the guys kind of knew this was coming, and that's the reason that you go out and you get Tyler Huntley because now you have four guys that you feel, if we need to go and use you, we can find a way to win an NFL game with you. Yeah, they've made a few moves this offseason that are proving to be forward thinking as far as the rules go. This is one of them. And this is also a byproduct of what happened last year. You see how many quarterbacks they had to go through and the moves they had to do and, and pull guys, you know, off the couch and all these things. This is just, you're just preparing, you know, if someone like Hundley was sitting there, wasn't drawing interest, if you could bring him in and, and you know, place him on a practice squad, if he loves the situation that he's in, because he would have to agree. You know, Pete teams couldn't just poach him because he has tenure. He could he could kind of filter through, and you have a playable option. You have four playable options. You we you would have killed for that last year. 
You know, so this is just forward thinking and knowing how the rules are going to unfold, getting this many people in your quarterback room that you feel comfortable with is a luxury and ones that the Browns are taking full advantage of. Yeah, and, and I think both Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry have shown when something happens and it's like, eh, we weren't really – they learned from their situations. And I think you could say the same thing about the head coach. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what you want to see. I mean, you're going to make mistakes, you know, no matter what your walk in life is. But if you can learn from those mistakes and not repeat them, that, that's, that's how, you know, you either win or lose. You know, this is, this is winning. You know, even if you, if you learn something from it, and you saw that happen last year. They had all kinds of quarterback catastrophes happen left and right, and you've seen they learn from that and they're moving forward in the best way they know how. All right, uh, NFL free agency's riskiest signings. This is from the 33rdteam.com. Uh, they say the Browns trade for and extend Jerry Judy. It's a gamble that Judy will play better in a loaded offense with a quarterback in his own make-or-break season. It's forward-thinking move, but sometimes these risks don't work out. Considering Cleveland's tight pockets in coming years, the Judy deal could look exceptionally costly if uh, he's not clearly the difference maker in 2024. Again, I don't, I don't, they clearly aren't paying attention because they, um, there aren't tight pockets to begin with. And the other thing is the, the wide receiver market is probably, you, know, you could, I, I guess you can make the case the edge market. Uh, wide receiver market, like the quarterback market, it's just going up and up and up and up. There's a guy named, you know, Jamar Chase and another guy named uh, Justin Jefferson. They're going to be free agents. They're going to get a gazillion dollars, and that's going to push the middle of the market up above where it is now. Uh, unless Jerry Judy comes in and is – not anywhere near what they think he is. If he's even more disappointing than the than he was in his time with the Broncos, it's not a bad signing. If he comes in and is better, it's a really good signing, bordering on a great signing. Yeah, that market's only going one place. That's going up, and that's going to push everything else up. This is this them getting ahead of the line, getting someone locked in place who they believe. Obviously, this is a projection, you know, and it's easy to look at this as a risky move. You can see it through that lens. But if he performs just slightly above what he did in Denver, this is a fine contract. If he overperforms, we're not talking about the contract. You know, they lock someone in who they believe is a high-level number two right now but has the capability to be a number one. So, yes, this is a projection. And just because they did this with Njoku, and it worked with Njoku, that doesn't mean every time they do it it's going to work. This one could fail. But just based on where they were at, they felt the need that we all saw. We all kept talking about them needing you to get a number two receiver. They made the move they felt necessary to secure that, and here we are. If this thing works out and he performs to the level, if he, you know, scores six touchdowns and 800 yards, that is not a failure. You know, that, that is what a number two is expected to do. If he cracks 1,000 yards and scores eight to ten touchdowns, this is a home run. And, again, it's important to note, they're not paying him what a number one wide receiver is going to get in the market. They're paying him a higher-end number two, which is what they project him to be. So it, the, the contract matches, you know, what they expect him to do on the field. All right. Uh, this is from Dog Pound Daily. Five Browns fighting for their job after free agency. Number five, uh, they say Jerome Ford. Four and three, they go the, uh, the young wide receivers, David Bell, Cedric Tillman. Number two, Siaka Ika. And the top one, uh, Dorian Thompson-Robinson. Um, I think all of their roles will be different. I, I think they probably all make the roster without question. Um, Jerome Ford's going to make the roster. I, I, the only thing negative you could say about Jerome Ford, <clears throat> I don't know that he's a lead back. I, I don't know that you want to strap your offense to him. Um, too many negative yards or, or one or two or yard loss and not enough three yard, three, four, five yard gains. Love the 80 yard gains, um, but too many wasted plays if you're going to be the lead back. Yeah, I don't feel his job is on the line. I feel his role is on the line. And you said it. They don't view him as a workhorse back. Those are few and far between in this league anyway, so that's no slight. Uh, but they, they saw what life was like without Nick Chubb, and they're preparing for that eventuality in case that comes to fruition to start the season, and you don't want to have to hand the ball off to him 15 to 20 times a game. So you lessen that. You go get a workhorse type back and form it. Now, Ford did show promise as a receiving back, 
But they also upgraded that role with Naeem mm-hmm. Hines. So he falls somewhere in the middle. Will he still have a role in this offense? Yes, he will. It'll just be lessened. They're going to hope that he gets more impactful with less repetitions, and hopefully he starts to see the game and it starts to slow down for him. Because at times that's where I think most of our complaints would come would be with his vision. He wasn't seeing the stuff that was there and leaving meat on the bone. So less than that, let him develop, and you got guys that can pick that up around him. So if you're without Nick Chubb, will you still see Jerome Ford? Yes, you will. It'll just be a little bit less. Yeah, and, and Deuce Staley may help with that as well. You, you never know, uh, and, and it's nothing against Stump Mitchell. Different voice, different way of, of instructing, you, you might see uh, something pop. I, I'm interested, the young wide receivers, I have no idea what Cedric Tillman is yet. I, I saw some really good, and I saw some things that were like, eh, that's a rookie. David Bell, um, I don't think he's incredibly skilled or athletic, but I think he's a good receiver. Yeah, a good possession receiver, and Tillman's going to be a boundary guy. But we don't even know what their full obstacles are going to be this year. I still fully anticipate them drafting a receiver. Yeah. Now, if that comes in the second round, then it starts to push them down. But if they take another swing on a mid to late round guy, you know, you don't feel they're as as in danger. You know, so we don't even really know what they're facing yet as far as an obstacle. But we know one thing, by adding Judy – they all slotted down a peg, yep. which I think might be exactly what they needed to get to be where they're supposed to be instead of last year having to play above. So I think that that affords more time. Obviously, Tillman has another year to develop behind Bell. Bell's been – this will be Bell's third year here. He kind of has to show something this year or they will move on. Tillman has a little more wiggle room. Yeah, and, and relative to Ika and, and Thompson Robinson, during Thompson Robinson, I don't think they ever thought he was going to have to start – like he did. Um, yeah. Ika, need to see more. Um, but, again, he was playing against uh, – he was playing behind some really good players. Let's see full off season, another year with, with Jim Schwartz. Let's see what he looks like in year two. Yeah, I don't know how he sees the field. I just – if you look at what they have in place, which is funny because the night they drafted him, I thought for sure he was going to have a heavy role – and then the way the room developed to put him on the back burner, which as a rookie, that's cool. That's fine. You know, I think defensive tackle is a hard position to come right in and be the man. You know, sometimes you see that all across the league. But now with the addition of Quentin Jefferson too, I just don't I don't see a, a role for him unless there's a giant injury. You know, so I don't know how he sees the field. So how do they view that? You spend a third round pick on him, but if he spends two years where he's unable to even be active for game day. I don't know if they start phasing him out. It just it depends on how it works out. But if he makes a gargantuan leap into year two and can be a run stuffer, there's room for that. So it's up to him and his development. But if he doesn't make that leap by the end of this upcoming season, it's hard to, for me to envision a role for him going forward. Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. And I'm going to step aside, take a quick time out, other side of the break. Back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Also some... Uh, More rule changes that were voted on and passed at the owners' meeting today. We'll talk about that. Sports with CLE. Be right back. Stay with us. Go ahead and pop a clamp on that. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery, like this new $20 100X with its million-dollar grand prize, I want to get my cut of that 76% payout. So, good news... We're playing the largest family of scratch-offs ever. These Lady Lucks have all the fun and no complications. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Chris. I'm calling from Naples, Florida. Just a couple comments. Number one, the NFL are such hypocrites. Don't tell me they care about the health because they got three words for you. Thursday night football. And as long as they keep doing that, there's no way that they care about the health of the players. My second question is this. Do you see a place where DeWan Jones starts in, in place of Jack Conklin this year or of Jed Wills that starts off slow? They move DeWan Jones over there. Thank you very much. Have a great day. As always, appreciate uh, all of the voicemails. Um, Casey, uh, NFL and 
they're just creating more revenue. Thursday Night Football is another TV deal. It's more revenue. Um, they split the revenue with the players, but I get, I get where he's going with that. I completely get where he's going with that. Um, Jones? Yeah, you, you, you want to keep him playing. I, I don't he, – he looked really good, but in order to continue to grow, he's got to be on the field. He's not going to continue to grow by watching it. Yeah, um, I want to touch on the player safety thing real quick, and it's – for me, does the hip drop tackle belong in the player safety conversation? Yes, obviously it does. It is something that has proven to, to be quite hazardous to, to offensive players – uh, so I get the emphasis to try to get it out. I don't agree with how they went went about it, but it is something they need to phase out. But how does that leapfrog natural grass? Having these guys play on artificial turf? Well, that's going to cost the, the owners money. So it didn't cost them any money to vote this move out. But, you know, to get them these players on natural grass would go a long way to keeping them healthy. Thursday night, I think to make Thursday night football reasonably healthy, I think you need to add a second bye week. So but that's a whole other conversation. As far as Dewan Jones, like he, not only do can I see a, a, a reality where he's he starting, you know, starts for Jack Conklin, he has to. There's no way you can keep Dewan Jones off the field. There, it's just it'd be malpractice. You have to find a way to get him on the field. Do I know what that looks like right now today? I do not. You know, and this could be a situation that works itself out. I've heard a lot of how Nick Chubb's progressing. I've heard a lot of how Deshaun Watson's progressing. I haven't heard a peep about Jack Conklin. Is there a possibility that he doesn't even return for the season? I think that has to be on the table. He's battled a ton of injuries. But at the end of the day, you have to play Dewan Jones. My argument for not putting him over at left tackle was, if you were going to do that, that had to start the day after the season ended. The biomechanics necessary to make that switch that he had to be working on that drills now, yesterday, you know, in order to make that switch. It isn't something where you get in the season and Will struggles and you just decide to make that switch. That is not beneficial for Dewan Jones. So they have to figure out a way to get Dewan Jones on the field. I just don't know what that looks like today. I think that's something that'll have to play itself out by the time we get to, you know, August. So we've talked a little bit about the owners' meetings uh, going on in Orlando. They did approve a new kickoff rule. Um, this is what it looks like uh, graphically. So the ball will be kicked off from the 35-yard line. Receiving team um, lines up at their 35 with the line. The kicking team lines up at the receiving team's 40-yard line, and the landing zone is between the 20 and the goal line. If this looks similar to people that watch spring football, it is very similar to the XFL. Here's kind of what it looks like. And uh, so what they're doing, in essence, is they're, they're shortening the, the long collisions that you get where people run down and, and knock down gunners. Um, it's intriguing. It, the special teams coaches are the ones that have come up with it. So, I, okay. We'll see what it does. I, I get, I could see where that would mitigate some of the injuries that you had on uh, on kickoff team and, you know, people running, you know, 40 yards and and hitting each other. Yeah, this is just a swing at keeping kickoff a viable play, and I'm sure the people, the receiving team, frontline blockers are going to be happy about this rule because you get teed off on in that situation where you're sprinting 35 yards one way just to turn around and catch a bullet. Um, but I do think that this is going to bring about some interesting. Uh, circumstances to where if you have two players back there, it's going to be very rare that both your returners are of equal skill. So there's always going to be a guy that teams, that the kicking team wants to get the ball. Someone like the Browns, you got Naeem Hines, but you also got Proche. You could also throw Ford back there. There's a couple things you could play with, but I, I, I do think that they're, by doing this, I think you will see kickoff become more relevant again as far as teams searching for kick returners. It had basically become a ceremonial play you know, for all, all sakes and purposes. So to get to get this, get juice back into it, to give it some life, you know, I, I don't think it'll be something astronomical, but would I be surprised if two or three kickoffs get returned this year for touchdowns? I will not, you know. And so then it turns to teams searching for these returners, maybe even through the draft. 
you know, drafting a guy for that singular purpose that in years past they would have passed on because it didn't make that much of an impact in the game. So I think this could impact the game in several ways. I'm interested to see how it plays out. So um, take a look at this. We've, we've talked a little bit um, about the Browns potentially opening the season in Brazil against the Eagles. And uh, now we know it will be either the Browns or the Packers. Um, this is coming out of the owners' meeting as well um, today. It'll be the Browns or the Packers in Brazil against the Eagles. We also know that the game will be televised exclusively on Peacock, um, and we should know later this week, uh, potentially as early as Thursday um, or as late as Friday, Saturday. Um, but the Browns, Packers, it'll be interesting to, to see again. Okay, you want to open the season in Brazil? All right, sure. Yeah, uh, not to toot our own horns, but we called this the day they announced it. <laughs> yep. The Packers are us. So we're here now. Uh, I'm all for it. I, I couldn't think of a better situation if you're going to have to play an international game. Do it to kick off the season. You do it on a Friday. Teams are home Saturday. They get a full week of preparation before the next game. So it won't change up your schedule at all. And there's fans... There, that's a big gap between that Thursday night kickoff and then when they go all the way to Sunday to get football on a Friday night, you know, it's, I'm all for it. It's only 164 days away, people, so so uh, get, get your spots ready. It's going to be happening on the Peacock. Yeah, the, the, other thing, um, the other thing that it does is uh, a lot of attention, and, and it's the first game ever in Brazil. So, again, a, a sport-crazed country, mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and you can be sure – um, they will love American football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, I think the NFL knows what it's doing. Those are, if you're narrowing it down between, you know, all, honestly, this is like the biggest takeaway for me is, I do believe this team will travel well. I think they, they will learn from mistakes from last year. But if you have an opportunity to play the Eagles, not in Philadelphia, <laughs> take that. <laughs> I, I would rather play them in Brazil than in Philadelphia. So. That's my biggest takeaway. Casey Kinnaman and I can step aside, take one more time out, other side of the break, back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Uh, we'll turn our attention a little bit to the upcoming NFL Draft Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hi, Tony Frost, lifelong Browns fan, 56 years old. Got one question. I see we brought Kay York back. Do we still have Dustin Hopkins under contract? I wasn't sure what his contract consisted of. Thank you very much. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Casey, uh, Hopkins is under contract, uh, $2.87 million for next year, so one more year left on that. Um, the Cade York sign is a pretty good one. If you thought he was talented enough to draft him where you drafted him, um, get him on the practice squad and see if he can develop. Yeah, no-brainer. This is just an opportunity. You know, like you just said, they, they thought enough to draft a young man, and it was viewed around the league. Like, it wasn't like they took a chance. Like, he was the consensus best kicker available. They took a swing on him. Immediately, dividends were paid. And then there was there were some gaps in, in consistency. And then he did what he did during the preseason last year. And they understand that during their winning window, they have to have consistency at that position. So they had to make the move to bring a veteran in. But if you have the opportunity to bring that young man in, get him on the practice squad, and let him work th through some things where you don't have to rely on him to actually pee on the field, that's a no-brainer. You know, and, and if it did, if it gets five, six weeks in and it's evident that there's something's not clicking, you move on and you bring another guy in. But this is a no harm, no foul. I know some people are going to PTSD over just seeing you work, you know, because you're probably going to get to see him work in during the preseason and do some things. But that's what this young man needed. This young man needed, he took some lumps. 
you know, and, and to be a kicker, you have to be mentally strong. So if he's able to get through that, he definitely has the, the skill. He has the leg. He just has to put it together between the years. And if he can do that, he can have a long career in the NFL, even if it's not with Cleveland. So more power to the Browns, bringing a guy in, you know, they already had faith in, bring him in, let him work through his stuff. And eventually that might pay dividends down the road. It also shows you um, they trust their evaluation of players. Um, and, and we've seen that time and time again. But but this regime, Andrew Berry, Kevin Stefanski, uh, when they like a guy, they're going to give him the opportunity to develop. It, it, then that's the sign of a good organization, actually. Yeah, stay the course. You know, and everybody wants change. Everyone wants to blow everything up every other week and start over. But the reality is that's the reason this regime's still here. And it's the reason they're in talks right now to get an extension is because they believe in their process and the organization believes in their process. And that's what gets you to these results. So, and it's, we're talking about a practice squad kicker. What does it hurt right. to bring him in and try to let him work through his issues? This is a no brainer for me. All right. Uh, NFL draft boom or bust prospects. This is from PFF. Uh, wide receiver Xavier Worthy from Texas. Strength was an issue at, uh, for Worthy at times throughout his Texas career. That was visible in the form of getting uh, free from stronger defenders and press. Also, when securing catches, Worthy has the speed to be a major difference maker. But there's a baseline for strength that needs to be uh, that need that is needed to succeed at the NFL level. Braden Fisk, Fisk, incredible at both the Senior Bowl and NFL scouting combines this draft cycle. Uh, what makes him boomer bust lack of strength wingspan and arm length rank in the fifth and third percentiles respectively for the position ultimately we'll know more about the boomer bust potential based on where he is drafted um worthy I, I get what they're saying with the strength he looks more like a football player who you know can run fast than a track guy who's converted at least to me and i've seen him play quite a bit fisk a lot of people make the, – the question is, can he play with leverage? Joe Thomas will tell you he wasn't the strongest um, offensive lineman, but he was moving guys around because he played with really good leverage and understood that. Yeah, these are both players that we were actually talking about before they tested at the combo, based on their merits on the field, based on their tape. But the difference is we're talking about at pick 54 or pick 85 – the difference is now that Worthy's put that 4.21 the combine, he may get overdrafted. And that's where the bus factor comes in. You know, if he gets launched into the to the end of the first round, the potential for bust is much bigger. If you get picked in mid, you know, day two, that, that mitigates itself. Uh, but based on what Worthy can do, he, just to your point, he doesn't have those growing pains as someone, a track guy converting. He tracks the ball really well. He does lack a little bit of play strength because he's light, you know, but you, you find ways to utilize that kind of guy and, and get him free releases and get him deep. You know, you, you have to have realistic expectations when you bring a player like that in, but you do that because of that upside. That 4 one speed was apparent on tape. It wasn't just because he practiced really hard at the 40-yard dash. That kid has true, legit, third-level, mind-blowing speed. You know, and that may get him overdrafted, and in that case, he could end up being a bust. But if he gets slaughtered properly and falls to a team day two, you know, maybe even beginning of day three, depending on how, because this, this is a deep wide receiver class. Even with that speed, he's probably still not a top ten receiver in this draft. But Fisk is a different one. I think his age kind of gets him out of where he we would pick him at fifty four. But some teams want to take a, a shot on those traits. I mean, and his, his tape's fine. Crazy good motor, relentless does sometimes lack leverage, has a good punch at the line of scrimmage, can get caught hand fighting. There's, a, there's enough there to not to keep him out of the first round. So I feel much more comfortable saying that he will be slaughtered appropriately and be given a chance to develop without all the crazy expectations. But based on how they did test, that expectation for them to be a performer might be there sooner than it needs to be. So let me ask you this about Fisk. Fisk is, you mentioned, older. The Browns may have to tweak their guardrails just based on NIL and lack of underclassmen coming out because um, it, the guys are staying in college because they can make a couple hundred thousand dollars in NIL. Yeah, that definitely has to play into it. I just think it's always going to be, no matter what, I think it's going to be a tiebreaker situation. If there's more than one prospect they're in on, they'll probably go towards the younger 
the majority of the time. Uh, the problem with Fisk is I think, you know, I think he is going to go in that second round range. And I think there will be plenty of younger prospects still available who are going to play their entire rookie season at age 21 or 22. And I think that that's what pushes him off the Browns board. Now, if it was 85, that might be a different scenario. But that's something we have to see as this plays out with NIL and, and you know, the COVID year that pushed everyone to be like super seniors. At what round do they bend those guard rounds? It definitely hasn't been on day two as of yet. You've seen them do it into day three. But as this holds up and players are staying in college longer, they may have to bend on day two eventually. Yeah, and, and you mentioned um, Worthy kind of being overdrafted. John Ross is the guy whose uh, time he beat, and, and Ross just never made it. But but I remember Ross at Washington, and I remember thinking, he's kind of a not really a football – Worthy looks more yeah. like a football player to me than John Ross did. Yeah, he looks more comfortable in the balls in the air. He does have a little bit of lack of concentration with some of his drops, but it's not fundamental. It's not like a fish out of water type scenario. Like you mentioned with John Ross, you know, and, and that time got him pushed up in the first round early. Now, I don't think that that will happen to Worthy. I still think that if he goes in the first, it would be towards the very end of the first. Uh, but there are definitely applicable traits that he has as a receiver that are that have nothing to do with his speed, you know. But there are certain things that he's going to have to work on to, to develop, you know, that play strength, getting off press man coverage, those type of things will be what slows his development down. But if he can go to a team that just needs him to run go balls to start off his career, that would be a blessing in disguise because that's something he can do day one. Casey Kidman, Dog Pound Daily, as well as the Barking Browns podcast, as always. Great stuff, Casey. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much. Hey, anytime. Casey Kidman, make sure you check him out. Dog Pound Daily, he is also uh, one of the co-hosts of the Barking Browns podcast. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.